Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is part four for Zoom recorded lecture for the topic consideration. So in the previous part, part three, we covered about adequacy of consideration. So for now, part four, we are going to cover four, bar four barons to sue, performance of existing duty and also uh, public duty. Okay, three uh, subtopics under for this lecture. Okay, the first one, four barons to sue. So forbear, or another word is forego. Okay, what's the meaning here? To abstain from or relinquish or dispense with. So mean that hey, you have the rights to sue, but you forbear, you abstain from uh, suing. So it involves the foregoing, okay, forego, forbear, of the exercise of a legal right. So consideration here lies in the detriment. Mean that, hey, you suffer detriment, you suffer certain losses. Okay? You have the right to sue. Okay? You has a right to resort to a court okay, and the corresponding benefit to the other party who is safe from legal proceeding. I mean, yeah, uh, the one who decides to forbear, to forego the rights to sue, okay, will suffer certain detriment losses and it gives corresponding at the same time benefit to the other party. Okay, because why? Uh, he, the, uh, he is safe from legal proceeding, no need to go for the trial whatsoever. So it, it is relevant, it will be, um, I mean, it is applicable okay, to a person who has a valid claim against another, either in contract or in talks, okay? but he chooses, okay, he promises to forbear, to forego from enforcing it. So is it a valid consideration? Yes, it is. Okay? It, is uh, it, it constitutes a valid consideration if it is made in return for a promise okay, by, the other by the other to settle the claim. So in other words here, it means this is something which is a compromise. Okay? It is a compromise of suit. And yes, it is actually, it may constitute consideration, valid consideration, which is recognized in the eyes of law. Let's have a look at the case. The case is, we discussed uh, the, this, the, this case actually uh, previously, but we are going to look at from perspective of, of forbearance to sue. So HSBC and Sharikat United Leong, we discussed the case when we discussed about past consideration. So here, for a claim based on forbearance to succeed, uh, for, for a claim based on forbearance, okay, in order for the claim to succeed, okay, it must be proved okay, by direct evidence okay, or even by inference okay, from the circumstances from the facts of the case that the guarantor, okay, the one who give the, the director of the company, who give the who signed the guarantee, okay, the guarantor had requested forbearance and that forbearance was granted. And as far as the case was concerned, actually, there was a total failure okay, to prove that the second defendant at any time requested forbearance because there was actually an argument by on the part of the bank, okay, he said, okay, we forbear. I mean, we did not proceed earlier okay, to sue because it was uh, requested okay, by the um, by, by the data, the one who asked for the loan. But the court said, where's the evidence? Okay? So there was no evidence. It was a failure to prove okay, that there was any request uh, for forbearance. Yeah. Okay, here, meaning here, uh, there, there was allegation, but then it wasn't uh, properly proved. So the court didn't accept okay, the argument. We have another case, judgment by federal court, Tan Chiu Tu and T Kim Kuei. Let's go to the facts now. Okay, just I mean previously we, we look at the um judgment, okay, quotation from the from the decision of the court. So now we want to know what happened between the parties here. It involved a single piece of land, okay, for which two documents of title were issued. So I mean, normally, okay, for one piece of land, only one document of title, we call it grant, okay, IDT, okay. Uh, I mean, proving the ownership, who owned the, whatever details here, who owned the land, okay, what are the, the details, okay, whatever the information of the land. And then what happened was that respondent was issued with document of title registered in September 1968. But later, okay, a also was issued with, with another document. On the, I mean, it's about, it relates to um, exactly the same piece of the land, okay, registered in December 1972, so four years later. So respondent uh, issued a writ. Okay, what is a writ? A writ is a writ, I mean, usually order from the court. Okay, a written command in the name of a court or other legal authority to act or abstain from acting in a particular way. Okay, so respondent now issued a writ against the appellant. So a respondent was claiming vacant possession, meaning, oh, the land belongs to me. Okay, I'm claiming vacant possession of the land. And also I'm claiming for monetary compensation for loss of income. 
So the trial judge held that respondents claim okay, on account that his title prevailed over that of the appellant that it was registered earlier. I mean, the court look at the date. Okay, who was uh, given, uh, I mean, uh, the, the title, who, who, I mean, the date, which one is the earlier date here? And then the court also uh, look at or refer to a written compromise agreement. We call it compromise between the parties. But the court said, well, this is invalid. Okay, the court held that it was invalid. So when the case was brought to the federal court here, the, the court re-looked at the validity of the compromise agreement. And the court need to interpret, okay, what's the legal implication here? So in its true construction in, interpretation, actually, it was a compromise here of the dispute between the parties in respect of the land. The court said, well, it has some legal implication or value here. So the court said that, federal court said that, in respect of compromise agreement, okay, the court will often inquire, okay, investigate into sufficiency, okay, but not adequacy of consideration. Because why? Sufficiency in law is synonymous with validity. So the case also relates to sufficient, sufficiency and validity, okay, concept of adequacy of consideration. And the court looked at the compromise agreement. Okay, what's consideration between them? So consideration for such compromise agreement may be may often be once bona fide promise, okay, in good faith, to reframe or forbear from litigating a claim. Okay, what, what the party will receive in exchange in return, in exchange for a promise from that the other party to give up a bit of or a part of that which that other party claim. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we are not going to proceed with the trial with the uh, suit, okay. But then there must be something in return, uh, exchange. So that what is valid actually. So that's basically the discussion. Just a short discussion on for forbearance to sue, which is valid, provided uh, it is properly proved in the court of law. Because if it wasn't proved, then uh, it won't be valid. It won't be uh, recognized. We go to another subtopic, which is performance of an existing duty. So uh, if someone, okay, the promiser, promise to do something they are already bound to do under a contract, then is it a, is it a valid consideration? No, it's not. You are already bound. Okay, why you promise to do it? Uh, I mean, it's like double or repeated okay, based on the same thing, overlapping. So in other words, performance of an existing contractual duties cannot be a good consideration to pay extra under the same. I mean, you perform one act, but then you you uh, you receive two payment. It's like double pay, for example. That one, no, it's not valid. The second one is not valid. Okay, the extra payment. So this is what happened in this case. Um, classic case from common law. Stick and Myrick, 1809. Two out of 11 sailors deserted a ship. They left, left uh, a ship, lah, basically. Okay, two out of 11. Only two, okay? So I mean, that year remaining would be uh, nine, okay, and the captain, okay, promised the remaining one, promised the the nine sailors to pay, uh, extra, okay, if they managed successfully sail the ship back, but yes, it was done successfully, but later the captain um didn't want to honor the promise, okay, the captain refused to pay, okay, and the court held that, as the sailors, the the, the nine sailors here were already bound by their contract to sail back. Okay, and to meet such, such emergencies of the voyage. So promising to sail back was not a valid consideration. It's already in their contract, actually. Okay, contract of employment here. So yes, captain did not have to pay extra money despite the promise because promise is based on the existing consideration okay, uh, on, on the part of the other party. So it's not valid. But compare um, with the following case, similar but different, different decision. The case is Hartley and Ponson B. Ponson B, okay, 1857. Here, just now, two out of 11. Now, 19 out of 36 crew, okay, of a ship. So, it's a big number, okay. Uh, deserted the ship here, okay. So, the captain promised to pay, okay, the remaining crew extra money to sail back. But, of course, again, it happened later, uh, the captain refused to pay, saying that, well, you're only doing your normal job, okay. I didn't want to pay you extra money. But in this case, it's slightly different okay, as compared to the, to the case of Stick and Myrick here. In Hartley and Ponson B, okay, the ship was so seriously undermanned. I mean, no people okay, to really uh, make sure that the, the ship can sail back to, uh, to the port here, right? 
So the rest of the journey had become extremely hazardous, very, very high risk, okay? very, very dangerous to sail back the, the, the ship in such a situation. So the court held that, okay? uh, distinguishing okay, from the earlier case here, sailing the ship back in such dangerous conditions okay, was something which is over and above their normal duties, even though it was mentioned in their contractual, um, I mean, employment contract. But it's something which is extra. Okay? So it discharged the sailors from their existing contract. And then they are free okay, to enter a new contract for the rest of the voyage. So yes, they were entitled to the money as promised by the captain. So this is the uh, distinguishing part. Okay? The, it's different okay, compared to the case of Stig and Myrick here. And then we also have another case, okay, which actually this is the current position. Okay? Uh, principles that are instilled in Myrick okay, now was amended by this case, Williams and Rofi brothers. So from this case, the ratio is that if the performance of an existing contractual duty confers, okay, give a practical benefit on the other party, on the one who promised to pay. So yes, is this a valid contract? Yes, this can, this can constitute a valid consideration. I mean, yeah, it is, it's like a fresh consideration okay, to pay for extra payment. This is what, uh, what the court held in the case of Williams and Rofi Brothers Limited in the year 1990. Let's have a look at what happened in Rofi and Will Rofi, Rof sorry, Williams and Rofi Brothers here. Rofi had a contract okay, to do what? To refurbish a block okay, of flats. And Rofi had subcontracted sub the carpentry work to Williams. Okay? And after the work had begun, okay, it became apparent okay, that Williams had underestimated the cost. Okay? Um, he, had, he quoted a lower cost, lower, lower pay, lower amount to be paid. Actually, it should be more. Okay? And now Williams had, uh, was in financial difficulties okay, to perform because of the uh, lower amount of money. Okay? So now Rafi, uh, because he's the main contractor, okay? uh, William is the subcontractor. So Rafi, he was concerned about the work. Okay? I mean, oh, maybe the work cannot be completed uh, within a time. Okay? So uh, he will be liable to pay penalty okay? because if cannot finish on time. Okay? So he agreed to pay Williams extra payment. I mean, okay, I'll pay you extra. Make sure it is finished on time. And then Williams completed the work okay? on more flats, but he did not receive full payment. So because of that, William was furious. Okay? He stopped work okay, and brought an action for damages as for compensation. So in the Court of Appeal, Rofi argued that, well, we have a contract. So you are only doing what, what you are contractually bound. Okay? And you had not provided any consideration, fresh consideration. Okay? You are supposed to complete the whole thing, the whole work. So I don't want to pay you extra. Okay? It's already mentioned in, the, in our contract. That's argument by Rofi. But the court held that here, okay? Uh, the first bullet there, okay? First box. So where a party to an existing contract later, it agrees to pay an extra bonus, okay, extra payment, in order to ensure that the other party perform, okay? Then actually agreement is binding, okay? Provided the, the one who promised the promisor had obtained some new practical advantage or avoided a disadvantage. I mean that here? You get the work to be completed on time, and then you avoid you avoid yourself from uh, being imposed with penalty uh, payment whatsoever. Okay, so in the present case, eh, there were benefits okay, to Rafi, including making sure Williams continued his work, and then avoiding payment under the uh, damages clause okay, of the main contract. And then avoiding the expense and trouble of getting someone help. Okay? So yes, can William enforce the promise? Yes, Williams was entitled to payment. Okay? So the, the, uh, the emphasis is whether okay, the promisor had obtained some new practical advantage, okay? whether he benefited from the, um, the, the, the work okay? after he made the, a fresh promise. Okay, uh, another subtopic is about public duty. Okay, the word public here means, uh, um, in Malaysia, we, uh, I mean, another relevant term, uh, synonymous term is servant, public servant, okay, government servant. So if someone is under a public duty to do a particular task, then agreeing to do that task is not sufficient consideration for a contract. For example here. Collins and Godfrey, 1831. So Godfrey promised to pay Collins okay, if Collins would attend court and give evidence for Godfrey. 
attending a court lah. Basically, the testifying the court can be to be the witness whatsoever. And then, actually, Collins here, he had been served with a subpoena. The subpoena, subpoena is a court order telling someone they must attend. I mean, you must attend. There's no other excuse. Okay? Otherwise, you will be liable for contempt of court. Okay? Court order must be performed. And then later, Collins sued for payment because Godfrey promised to pay him. But the court held that okay, Colin was already under a legal duty to attend a court because he received a letter already. Okay, Sapina here. All right. So actually, he had not provided consideration towards uh, Godfrey despite the promise by Godfrey here. So his action to get payment from Godfrey failed because he was legally, uh, I mean, he, uh, it was his legal obligation to pay the court. Okay. To pay the courts, uh, the, the, the trial in the court. But, okay, here, this is exception. If someone, if the public servant exceeds their public duty, then it may be a valid consideration. I mean, they have some extra work, okay, that the public servant do, okay? Example here is Glassbrook Brothers and Glamorgan County Council reported in the year 1925. It involved policemen. Okay? So, police is a public servant. Um, doing public, I mean, duty towards public. So, the police were under a duty to protect a coal mine coal mine okay? during a strike and the police proposed a mobile, mobile unit okay, in order to give better protection and the mine owner okay, promised to pay for police to be stationed on the premises and then police uh, complied with this request by the, um, by the mine owner, okay? the one who owned the mine, the coal mine. But when they claim the money, the police ask for the money, the mine owner refused to pay. And the mine owner argued, well, you actually carried out their, your public duty. So I don't want to pay you, okay, despite the promise to pay. But the court held that, although the police were bound to provide protection, yes, but they had a discretion okay, as to the form it should take. And uh, because the police believed that a mobile uh, police were sufficient, they had acted over their normal duty. They're not supposed to give this extra duty, actually. Okay? So extra protection okay, was actually a good consideration for the promise by the mine owner to pay. So yes, uh, it was valid and enforceable. So police were entitled to pay for the extra protection uh, given. Okay? And then uh, in year 1956, okay, similar approach by the court. In the, the, the case was uh, what and by him uh, here. A mother was under a statutory duty to look after her child. I mean, yeah, there was um, usually some, some order okay, from the court that the mother has to take care of the child here. And then because of that, the ex-husband promised to pay her one pound a week okay, if she cared for the child in a certain way. And later, the, the ex-husband didn't want to pay. He said, oh, you are already under a duty to, to take care uh, of the child. Okay? But the court held that. Notwithstanding the statutory duty imposed on the mother, but the mother could enforce the promise because what uh, she did in return more than what would otherwise have been required. So she gave extra, uh, something extra okay, to look after the child. So she could get um, the money. Okay? She could compel the, uh, the husband okay, to fulfill the promise to pay okay, uh, the amount here. Okay, that's it for this. But okay, we are going to continue later.